Hello and welcome to this candidates forum for the Massachusetts 12th Middlesex District State Representative. The primary election will be held on Tuesday, September 3rd. I'm Jen Adams, the news director of Newton News at New TV, and I will serve as the moderator today. This forum is co-sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Brookline and Newton and is co-produced with New TV. This forum is being recorded on Thursday, June 27th, 2024. The 12th Middlesex District in Massachusetts is one of 160 legislative districts included in the lower house of the Massachusetts General Court. The 12th Middlesex District represents approximately 45,000 people living in Brookline and Newton in Brookline Precincts 5, 13A, 14, 15. In Newton, Ward 5, all four precincts, Ward 6, all four precincts, Ward 7, Precinct 1, and Ward 8, all four precincts. The League is responsible for communicating with candidates and organizing the format, questions, and moderator. New TV's primary role is facilitating production and dissemination of the forum. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan, multi issue organization that encourages informed, active participation of citizens in government. The League does not support or oppose candidates or political parties. No League members involved in this forum, including the planners, moderator, and timekeeper, are endorsing, are endorsing either of the candidates for this office. Members of the League of Women Voters of Newton may become candidates for public office. While the League encourages their members to become politically active, there are specific procedures in place to ensure the integrity of their forums and fulfill their commitment to being a nonpartisan organization that does not support or oppose any political party or candidate. Please be assured that all efforts are made to create a wall between all of the candidates and league forum, forum planning. This barrier specifically includes no access to forum questions. If you have a concern about this, please do not hesitate to contact the league at info at lwvnewton.org. In the 12th Middlesex District, there are three candidates running for in the Democratic Party primary, and we'll meet them now. Mr. Bill Humphrey, who works in Political Communications and Media has lived in the 12th Middlesex District for 33 years and is currently a Newton City Councilor. Mr. Rick Lipoff is president and owner of Lipoff Real Estate Services, a real estate valuation and consulting firm that he has founded 33 years ago. He has lived in the 12th Middlesex District for 56 years and is also currently a Newton City Councilor. Dr. Greg Schwartz has been a primary care physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital and MGH for more than 20 years. He has lived here for 17 years and is a former Newton City Councilor. There are no candidates running for this office in the political, libertarian, or other parties. In Massachusetts, voters who are not enrolled in one of the three registered parties may choose to vote in any of the party primaries. Voters enrolled in a party may only vote in that party's primary. You may change your party affiliation before August 24th. The candidates received the format and ground rules earlier, and here is an overview. Each candidate will have 90 seconds to introduce themselves. We'll then move on to a series of questions directed at the candidates, which will rotate among, among them starting in alphabetical order. Response time will be 90 seconds. There will be a timer running in order to inform the candidates how much time remains as each candidate speaks. Stop will be displayed when the time is up, and candidates are expected to stop speaking when completing their sentence. As moderator, I will decide if there is a need for a rebuttal. Questions were collected in advance from the public via email and selected by the League of Women Voters. Questions will be addressed to all candidates and will apply to issues or qualifications for their particular office. We will ask as many questions as time allows, sometimes combining similar questions, striving to cover a variety of topics. We will finish with a 60-second closing statement from all candidates in reverse of alphabetical order. We will now begin with a 90-second opening statement from each candidate. And Bill, we'll start with you. I'm Newton City Councilor Bill Humphrey, and I'm asking for your vote for state representative in the September 3rd Democratic primary for the 12th Middlesex District in Newton and Brookline. I'm running because Massachusetts should be a commonwealth for everyone and a beacon for the nation. I've personally already knocked more than 5,000 doors, and voters agree. Massachusetts should be leading the way. We need a Green New Deal that gets us off fossil fuels with economic justice, controls flooding, and builds hundreds of thousands of green homes for young adults, seniors, and families. We need to restore a transportation system and road network that we can be proud of. 
we should establish pre-K universally as well as daycare and f public finally f properly fund our K through 12 public schools as well as increasing the funding for the higher education system in the public sector as well. We should also finally establish universal health care including abortion and maternal health and address mental health and substance use with more health programs not criminalization. We deserve a, an inclusive society for everyone. It's time to stop studying the problems and time to start implementing the policies that we know work. It's time to get the Massachusetts House of Representatives moving again. I will continue to be a responsive elected official with strong communications, political courage, and vision. I'm endorsed in this race by the Progressive Mass, Mass Sierra Club, the Mass Nurses Association, 1199 SEIU, and uh, I encourage you to visit BillHumphrey.org to learn more. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Rick, your 90-second opening statement, please. Thank you. I'm Rick Lipoff, a city councilor of 22 years, and I'm running to be your state representative. I was born and raised in Newton, and my parents were born and raised in Brookline, so my roots run deep in the district. From stuffing envelopes as a child to, to uh, being the chair of Seti Warren's campaign, democratic politics runs deep. I've served as vice president of the city council and chaired numerous committees, um, always looking to bring people together and get to yes. I founded my real estate appraisal firm tw 33 years ago and it still thrives today, giving me a small business perspective invaluable to pair with my decades of service. At the State House, I will fight for Chapter 70 money and for MSBA funds to improve our schools. I will take action on climate, transitioning from fossil fuels and preserving open spaces. I will fight for more affordable housing, for gun control legislation, and for equitable and affordable health care. And I will do so in, with, in, with everything in my power, with a focus on fighting anti-Semitism and all forms of hate that have no place in our communities. My endorsers include State Treasurer Deb Goldberg, former Mayor David Cohen, and the Brookline and Newton Police and Firefighters Unions, and the Professional Firefighters of Massachusetts. I ask for you, your vote humbly on September 3rd. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Greg, your 90-second opening statement, please. Thank you so much. My name is Greg Schwartz, and I'm running to be your next state representative from the 12th Middlesex District. I'm running to replace and fill the shoes of retiring Representative Ruth Balzer, who has been a champion on environmental protection, mental health, protecting public lands, reproductive rights, and so many more issues. And I'm proud and honored that she has chosen to endorse me as her successor, having a confidence that I will continue her legacy. With me, you get three sets of skills. First, I've been a primary care physician for more than 20 years at the Mass General and Brigham Women's Hospital. Uh, there, as a trained medicine physician, I take a look at problems through a fact-based scientific approach and consult with experts to uh, get their opinions and then collaborate with my colleagues to get the job done for our patients. Also, as a primary care physician, I think about prevention, thinking about what we can do now for patients to prevent harms later. As a result, these two approaches are very relevant to the State House and I think would be very helpful on uh, policy making. The second thing you get with me is eight years of experience on the City Council. And the third thing is I'm trained as a lawyer and I'll bring that experience to the State House to fight for you on environment, housing, transportation, and health care. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. The first question will be directed first to Rick, and you have 90 seconds to respond to this. All right, here we go. Question number one. You have each served on the city council. Which accomplishment demonstrates your effectiveness to get things done, and what is your superpower that distinguishes you from your opponents? I'll take it backwards. My superpower has got to be the 22 years, but it's, it's also the time spent as chair of land use, getting some of the largest uh, projects through to the finish line. Uh, when you are in a room with developers, with neighbors, with the planning department, it takes a lot to keep everything together and to find a way to the finish line. Um, one of the things I'm most proud of is my public-private partnership that I worked so hard on with Kessler Woods. This was the Edison land and they wanted to sell it and it could have gone to a developer to do a ton 
of, uh, uh, of units, and we wanted to save some land. And so we partnered. We did a, pri a private partnership, public-private, with this developer to create some housing but save 20 acres of open space that are now walking trails along LaGrange Street in, in, in my neighborhood. It was a long haul. I think it was the first time we ever used CPA money, so it was really an exciting thing. Um, the market fell apart, and we got the street done with 13 homes, but the building that we wanted to build uh, stalled. And it took to go out to the market and find a new partner, uh, and I was involved at that with, with, with that with the executive branch, and finally got that building built a few years ago on LaGrange Street. So it's that kind of bringing people together of, of various uh, entities to get it done, and, and that's my power. Thank you, Rick. Greg, the same question to you. Would you like me to repeat it? Sure. You have each served on the city council. Which accomplishment demonstrates your effectiveness to get things done, and what is your superpower that distinguishes you from your opponents? So thank you for the question. I think that on the city council, when I was there from 2011 to 2019, we faced a lot of, a lot of con controversy around marijuana dispensaries. And um, I was asked by the, um, by the executive, the mayor, uh, to sit on an interagency uh, committee to consider what regulations and zoning changes we needed to make and how we would implement them for the marijuana dispensaries. I did that and then we brought it to the, uh, to the city council and we were able to get those done. There was a lot of discussions and a lot of concerns among uh, some of the population and residents that marijuana dispensaries were going to be a terrible you know, uh, issue and cause of traffic and crime and all kinds of other issues. We sat and listened and talked to traffic coordinators, police, made sure that we had a, a, a set of, uh, of, of zoning rules uh, that would enable there to be a more orderly and uh, stepwise review of the, um, of, of the implementation of these. So I think that that was, uh, that was one of the uh, accomplishments. Now, as far as a superpower, to do something like that, and also as chair of the Land Use Committee myself, I tried to listen to everybody. And I guess the one distinction I would make with Rick is that when I was chair of the Land Use Committee, uh, it didn't necessarily go fast. We didn't necessarily rubber stamp what the uh, developers wanted. We listened to both sides of the issue, sometimes with criticism from folks that didn't want us to do that and we got a good policy done. I didn't agree with it ultimately, but we did pass it. Thank you, Greg. Bill, the same question to you. Would you like me to repeat it? Sure. So as I stated, you have each served on the city council. Which accomplishment demonstrates your effectiveness to get things done? And what is your superpower that distinguishes you from your opponents? You have well, 90 seconds. I'd point to a couple of accomplishments, specifically in the arena of environmental protection. Uh, we had a two-year effort in the Programs and Services Committee, where I'm now the Vice Chair, working on uh, tree protection reform. And there was a wide range of opinions on the City Council, as well as in the Mayor's office, about what exactly should be done. Some people wanted the status quo, some people wanted less than the status quo, some people wanted much more. And we had to come up with something that could pass the Council, get signed by the Mayor, and then be successfully implemented by the Forester. And I think we eventually got there. It took a lot of work, a lot of compromise, discussions, we talked through the process with each other and I'm very proud of that. More recently, I helped step in at the last minute to protect the electrification ordinance that had been worked on for several years. I'm very proud of the work we did there. And one of the things that I think is a superpower, which I demonstrated there, is I'm able to bring the public into the process in a way that is not always true. And bringing that to bear can be extremely important for getting things done when things are kind of getting jammed up and people are not really sure what the public wants. And I think that also points to the other thing that I do, which is to make sure that I'm grounded in the district, both with two-way communication all the time, constantly getting back to people right away and making sure I have a newsletter going out, sometimes even by mail, and also canvassing regularly so I can get the full spectrum of opinions so that I know that the work that I'm doing as a city councilor and hopefully soon as a state rep is grounded in something that the district is looking for. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. We'll move on to question two, and Greg, we'll start with you. The public overwhelmingly supports improving transparency in our state legislature. Would you vote to make House legislative uh, to make House legislative committee votes public? And what else would you do to improve transparency in state government? 
So this is a question that we get at the doors and certainly in a number of the forums. And I think it's an extremely important question. We're a democracy. We need to run on information and access to voters. They need to know what's going on. Now, some of the representatives currently would debate whether how non-transparent they are. I think that every single representative needs to be open to their constituents and provide feedback and uh, newsletters and, and, and contact a two-way street and communication, and that is a major way in which they currently provide transparency. But what we can do on top of that, uh, well, we can build on what's already been done. They, uh, during COVID, started to televise all the hearings as well as the chamber uh, sessions. That can be expanded to further provide more details about what was discussed at those. The uh, State House News obviously does provide some feedback about what was done, but we need to have an official record of what was done at this committee level. The votes are uh, able to be determined, but it's a little bit hard to figure them out. So that should be published more, more clearly. Uh, but at, at the very basic, we need to make sure that when we make changes, that we bring the population along so that they can understand what the House is doing and why they're doing it. Thank you, Greg. Bill, uh, you the same question to you. Would you like me to repeat it? Um, sure. The public overwhelmingly supports improving transparency in our state legislature. Would you vote to make House Legislative Committee votes public? And what else would you do to improve transparency in state government? I think transparency and accountability are foundational to getting anything done on the major problems that we're trying to work on, like climate, housing, transit, and any number of other things. Committee votes certainly should be public and also more, better publicized and have a better website that's easier for ordinary people to navigate. Uh, we also need to apply the public records law to the legislature, just like is done for the current city council here in Newton. I support the Sunlight Act. I support uh, improved disclosure of when upcoming committee uh, hearings will be scheduled to allow better participation from the public. I support uh, uh, Auditor DiZoglio's efforts to audit the legislature. I support the establishment of the House of Representatives Legislative Staff Union, which I think will have a lot of unexpected benefits for transparency and accountability. But the other thing that's less of a transparency issue and just more of an operational issue is as things get completely centralized within a very small number of people making the decisions, it becomes harder for them to have enough hours in the day to be able to work on all the different topics that need to be worked on. It's better if those things can be delegated and have more work actually happen in committees. There's been a lot of articles recently in the Boston Globe about how many of these committees don't seem to do a lot of work. Um, and I think that's important to you know, make sure that we're utilizing everyone's time effectively. I think we're supposed to have a full-time legislature with full-time legislators, and I think that right now that's not always happening, and I think that's going to be really important for me as a legislator. Thank you, Bill. Break the same question to you. Would you like me to repeat it? No, that's okay. Um, I, I agree with almost all of what my colleagues here have, uh, have said. Um, for transparency for myself, I will have a monthly newsletter. I will let people know how I vote on everything. Um, but yes, transparency is a problem. Uh, the power at the top and, and things that happen in back rooms has been a tradition for a very long time. Uh, and, and I think that you can change a culture from within if you join and rise and become relevant. And uh, for me, uh, there's a lot of people that are activists about this, and, and I feel that way as well. But when you get a seat at the table, you go from activist to advocate. And that is something that I would do, that I would become an advocate for greater transparency and do it in a way that doesn't leave you irrelevant, that you can work with people, build bridges, and if you become relevant, you can change the culture. So I want to seat at the table when we're making policy for my district and for the state. And to do that, there's a nuance and a way to go up and talk about these issues. Uh, but clearly, there's a transparency problem. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to question number three. And Bill, we'll start with you. A portion of the new 4% millionaires tax, known as the Fair Share Amendment, or FSA, on the state's wealthiest residents is used to provide all public school students with free weekday meals. It is also planned to be used to invest in K-12 schools, making early education and care excellent and accessible and supporting higher education students. However, this revenue source can fluctuate. What legislation would you enact to stabilize revenue and what benefits would you prioritize? 
Well, I think it's always going to be a challenge to stabilize revenue. The most you can do is sort of try to get a better sense of how to predict it and have a wider range of sources so that if there's an economic uh, incident happening that it affects things in different ways and some of these balance each other out. That's certainly something that we've seen on the Finance Committee over the past several years at the municipal level. Certain types of revenues are more vulnerable to certain things happening in a given year and you want to try to balance those different things. The fair share amendment has been hugely important for doing some of those things that were mentioned in the question. Free lunch, for example. In the city of Newton, we finally got competitive bids for the provision of food services in our schools for the first time in a very long time because there was uh, this new program allowing free lunch and meals for everyone as a default state and that made it more interesting to the potential bidders. I think there's also a lot of areas where you can use some of the funds to make improvements on deferred maintenance and things like that in a way that's not operational. That way you are catching up on important things that we desperately need to catch up on, collapsing bridges, roads, dams, tunnels, things like that, without boxing ourselves into a situation where we are vulnerable to having operational revenue shortfalls suddenly come up. I think the other thing that's important to stress though is that it's difficult to say that we have a tough budget year if we're also voting for tax cuts for the rich that con con contradict some of the effects of the fair share amendment. Thank you, Bill. Rick, same question to you. Would you like me to repeat it? No, that's okay. Um, it, it's fantastic that we have this revenue going to transportation in schools. Um, your question is about the fluctuation of the piece that goes to the education system, correct? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have things called stabilization funds in the city of Newton. Maybe that's something that we can do at the state level. Maybe there's some base level that we say, okay, listen, we've, we've got this, it's fluctuating, but there's a stabilization fund that if we fall below, uh, we, can, we can reach that, that goal. Um, whatever it is, this is found money from before that we, when we didn't have this 4% tax. So whatever it brings to the table, it's so much more than we had before. Um, and uh, as for the transportation piece, if I could talk about that, uh, that money is so important. We have 400 bridges that are uh, nearing past their lifespan that need to be fixed. We have so much work to be done, not even before we get to the, the T. So this tax was very controversial. There's a lot of people uh, that have fled uh, to Florida and their businesses uh, that are choosing to go elsewhere. But guess what? I, b I believe uh, that this tax and w what it's going to for transportation and education uh, is, uh, is a good one uh, in doing great things. All right. Thank you, Rick. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, uh, the question to you, would you like me to repeat it? That's fine. I think, I, I think I've heard it now twice, <laughs> three times. So absolutely, this is great that we have this potential to make some of the investments that we need to make. And all the uh, education uh, initiatives that you mentioned are, you know, terrific. Uh, K through 12, early education, higher education, and free meals. The thing that distinguishes me, I think, from Bill, who was going on about just continuing to do all these things, is you ask the question is, what happens if the fund goes down? Now we can try to stabilize it, like Rick appropriately said, but and that's you know rainy day fund and other ways to try to su supplement it. But ultimately, budgets you need to make decisions and you need to make priorities, and that's something that I think when you look at Rick, uh, Bill's website, just about everything is in there: free health care, free child care, free free meals. Who, who knows? So you need to make a, de a, a readiness to make priorities. And so in these, this list that you gave us, I think early education would be a very high priority as well as higher education because early education has been shown to increase the uh, success rates of folks in college that far ahead. So you, if you do early education, you impact on the future of these kids so far in the future. It's a hugely multiplier effect. And secondly, higher education, we need higher education right now. It's, a, it's an economy that needs people who are specialized, uh, there are higher degrees that people need to be able to succeed in our economy. There's retraining that needs to occur. So higher education would be, along with early education, would be my two priorities. Of course I want all four, but if you can't choose all four because it's reality, you have to choose some. Thank you, Greg. Uh, Bill, you have 30 seconds. 
Virtually everything on my website that costs money is based on a bill in the legislature that proposes a specific revenue source to pay for that thing. This is a wealthy state. This is not a cash-strapped state. It's a question of political will, and it's a question of what kind of a society do we want to live in. I'm articulating a vision for a society that is better than what we have, instead of just accepting that some people are going to have it all, and some people are going to be desperately poor. Thank you. Greg, you have 30 seconds. So when you have a family, and you have a house, and you have other responsibilities in your home budget, you need to make decisions. You can't just have everything that you want. So a wish list is nice, but it's not reality. And so that's what I think we're, you need to be thinking about when you're deciding who you're going to send to Beacon Hill to be your advocate. Somebody who has that kind of experience, who's, uh, who's, who's had to balance a budget, or folks that like to think about ideals alone. Bill, you have 30 more seconds. A household budget is not the same as a state budget. It is not correct. It is a facile comparison that is often made in politics. It is not the same situation, and it should not be, that comparison should not be made. So Rick, no you income, have thir There's no revenue and, and payouts? Expenditures and revenues, Bill? I mean, that's pretty much what a budget is. It Greg, is not the you. same as a household thank you budget. Both. Rick, you have 30 seconds. Can I chime in? I'm yes. the guy in the middle, and I'm always in the middle. <laughs> Let me tell you, I'll, I'll give an example of what I think about it, maybe leaning over here. Um, the migration situation, the immigration situation, a billion dollars it's going to cost us next year, 7,500 7, families, okay? What's important is how do you pay for that? And everything can't be free. And our governor, who has a big heart, is saying, look, we've got to move people out in nine months because the whole thing will implode and it won't work for anybody. Tough decisions have to be made on the budget and it doesn't mean you don't have a heart, but it's, it's our job as, as reps. All right, we're moving on to the next question, question number four, and Rick, we'll start with you. In your opinion, what revenue source should the state be considering now that more and more vehicles are EVs and are no longer powered by gasoline, resulting in the gas tax income lessening each year going forward? It's a great question. That's a great question, and I don't have a specific source for you. I've been thinking a lot about it because with using less gas, we, you know, we're going to lose that tax. Um, people talk about uh, raising the rate uh, when you're driving on the, the Mass Pike. Um, they've talked about uh, um, excise tax increase. Uh, there's some local taxes that they're talking about with, um, with business tax, with hotels, giving a local uh, increase on that. We're going to have to find revenue from somewhere. And if we do the right thing and we go green and everybody starts buying uh, EVs and we have to start building new infrastructure along our highways, that's going to cost money. We're going to have to find a source. Um, and if I get to the State House, when I get to the State House, uh, I'd love to work on finding that out. But that's going to take some time. It's going to take some debate. It's going to take talking with our municipalities because new taxes, you know, have to be done the right way. Thank you, Rick. Greg, question to you. Would you like me to repeat it? That's fine. So this is a great question. We used to deal with this question sometimes with uh, tobacco control, which is what I worked on before going to medical school and law school. And that was, if you have these sin taxes and you are basically expecting a certain amount of income from your tobacco taxes, which are there because you want to discourage the use of tobacco products, you're going to ultimately, if you're successful, lose revenue if you're, if, if you're actually successful, which you want to be because you're trying to achieve a policy goal. Same thing here. EVs, we want more people in EVs, right? It's good for the uh, environment. It's, it's, very, uh, it's essential for fighting global warming. So we'll have fewer gas guzzling cars on the road, hopefully, and that'll lead to less taxes. So it's an excellent question. I think that the options, and again, I think you only have to, uh, you have to take a, a, an approach where you look at the options and make decisions between them, would be, in my mind, either increasing the gas tax, which unfortunately would be regressive, and a lot of people who drive don't have a lot of uh, disposable income, but that would help you move people, increase the incentive to move out of gas cars. Um, or you uh, tax the electricity to some degree to try to balance some of the, um, some of the costs. Uh, or you do excise taxes like Rick was alluding to with the sale of EVs. I think that it's a combination. You probably would try to calibrate it so that you're not causing too much pain, but you're causing enough uh, in incentive 
so that people will move in the right direction, which is away from gas and, and, and fossil fuels, which is what helps all of us. Thank you. Greg, Bill, the question to you. Would you like me to repeat it? That's all right. Okay. In the short run, the gas tax has not been increased for a while and is probably behind where it needs to be. But of course, in the long run, that's not a sustainable or viable source of revenue. There have been a range of proposals floated by various advocates and legislators over the years. Sometimes they talk about taxing mileage and things like that. That's not necessarily the best way to go either. And there have been proposals to tax carbon sources and then use that to pay for these things. But that is also not a sustainable source in the long run if we're trying to decarbonize the economy as a whole. Ultimately, what it comes down to is that the highway system, the roads network, just like almost everything else in our society, and certainly things like the public transportation network, are collective benefits to all of us. They are things that make the business environment in the state possible. They make all of the wealth creation in the state possible, and they are necessary in order to keep sustaining those things. Therefore, since it's a collective benefit, it's also going to have to be a collective responsibility to come up with a way to pay for it. And in general, I always favor progressive taxation as a way of doing that. And you know, the fair share amendment was a good start on that front, but there's always more to be done because that's who is benefiting from these uh, systems like the highway system. And therefore, we need to come up with revenue from the people that are benefiting the most heavily from it. Thank you, Bill. All right, moving on to question five. And Greg, we'll start with you. After experiencing the unknown or unfortunate state of the Stewart-owned hospitals, what oversight would you plan to legislate for private equity firms? So this is a great and important question. Uh, we as a state are facing a tremendous crisis right now with the eight hospitals run by Stewart Healthcare in bankruptcy. Still don't know who's going to buy them. They just pushed it off in another three weeks, the auctions, uh, and there aren't many buyers lining up. Uh, so Stewart, being a uh, private equity funded uh, health, health system, basically wanted to and needed to provide profits to its uh, investors and they ended up doing that by selling the land out from under the hospitals, uh, giving a big payout to the uh, investors and then label, uh, uh, putting all that debt uh, and, uh, and, and the cost of, of renting the uh, land, the hospitals back on the hospital system. So that was how they got into trouble. What we need to do is claw back, put in, put in a, a legislative uh, uh, requirements that you can claw back the profits that are given out to the uh, uh, investors if this uh, kind of event occurs, where a bankruptcy occurs. You can also increase the penalties to uh, include personal liability on the leaders of these health systems if they refuse to provide the financial data that Steward refused to provide for many years to the state that would have shown us that they were in trouble and that we could have made alternative arrangements and uh, taken contingency plans to protect the tens of thousands of patients that are going to be poorly served. Thank you, Greg. Bill, the question to you. Would you like me to repeat it? Uh, sure. After experiencing the unfortunate state of the Steward owned hospitals, what oversight would you plan to legislate for private equity firms? Well, I think that in the in the future tense, when we're talking about potential other situations where this could happen, I think we just need to get the profit motive out of healthcare completely. Healthcare is not supposed to be a commodity and certainly should be nowhere near community hospitals. And I think that that's going to be an important oversight step in the future. But the thing is, the steward situation, as Greg has mentioned, is far from over. It's still actively happening. And we need to, first of all, do eminent domain to get the land back underneath all of these hospitals. It's going to be impossible to unwind the situation without that land because who's going to want a hospital that doesn't have the land underneath it? And from there, it either needs to be direct state operation or it needs to be contracted by the state to various other experienced operators that are not for-profit entities. I think it's the state's responsibility, certainly to these communities when it comes to the community hospitals, to especially make sure that there's not only vigilance but corrective action taken here. And I've been very happy to work with the Mass Nurses Association and 1199 SEIU, United Healthcare Workers East, both of whom have endorsed my candidacy, both of whom have extensive number of members in these hospitals. They care a lot about these patients. They also know what's been going wrong in these hospitals for a long time, things like getting rid of the medical devices because they didn't pay the, the bills on time and they got repossessed. And so I'm happy to work with them uh, to make sure that their ideas as workers who are in these buildings are taken into account as part of this process. 
Thank you, Bill. Rick, the question to you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, this isn't a medical question. This is a real estate question, which is right in my wheelhouse. You do not sell your land that you have complete control over and take on a lease. It's a recipe for failure. And that's exactly what happened here. And that is directly attached to the profit, the profiteers. And private equity shouldn't be anywhere near our hospital system. I would be all for nonprofit only uh, to, to be owning our healthcare system. We have, uh, we have hospital, hospitals in underserved uh, areas that are taking the hit here. We have creditors over billions of dollars that are going to be left holding the bag. Would love to take it by eminent domain, but I understand the legal system, and I don't think that would ever be possible. And if you tried, it would be in court for years and years and years. We need to support our health care system, our doctors, our patients, our underserved communities, and this is one of the ugliest things that has happened in our community in a long time. And it needs to be cleaned up, and we do need to have legislation in place to make sure it never happens again. All right, moving on. Um, let's see. Bill, this goes to you first. Uh, tens of thousands of young adults have left Massachusetts and are choosing to live in places where housing is more affordable. What should the state government do to help prevent more young adults from leaving the state? Well, I certainly appreciate this question firsthand. Uh, I grew up in Newton. I'm 33. I live at my parents' house. That's a common story for many of the folks that I grew up with in Newton. Many of them have been living with their parents and family members and older relatives continuously, uh, uh, generally like I have been. And many of them have been coming back. And I see you know, every time I go to the doors that they're moving in with the grandparents or the grandparents are moving in with them as a sustainable cost strategy. This is not sustainable in the long run. What we're seeing happening is going to continue to happen unless we address the housing crisis. That means hundreds of thousands of new units built in the state by 2030. It means refurbishing existing units in the affordable housing stock and continuing to expand the affordable housing stock so that those folks are taking the pressure off of the uh, market rate units. It means building uh, housing at all different price points, legalizing ADUs, changing zoning, things like that. And I also think it's important to understand that we need the housing to be not only affordable but near the sources of employment for the most part. Whether you're a low-income person who's having to take four buses to get to work, that's not okay. Or whether you're someone that works in a fairly good paying job in the 128 corridor, you shouldn't have to be commuting huge distances. And we're certainly not going to be in a situation where we're building an enormous amount of high-speed rail at astronomical costs all over the state to serve people in new housing developments in areas where there aren't already people. Most of the housing is going to have to be in eastern Massachusetts and near the Boston area. Thank you, Bill. Rick, the question to you, would you like me to repeat it? No, that's okay. Um, this, is, this is why uh, the need for 200,000 plus units uh, is, is the mandate right now. Um, I hear from businesses all over uh, that they can't hire. They can't find young people who can, who can live here in entry level positions because they can't afford to live here. Uh, we've got to build and build and we've got to build the missing middle the units that are in between the affordable and the single-family homes. We've got to do more zoning reform. MBTA was a start, but there's even more that we can do. Transportation, housing, and climate have got to be talked about together. And every single uh, development that's built needs to, at, at best, be near um, transportation. We've got to get people out of their cars onto transportation, and when they come home, they got to stay out and have a walkable, uh, walkable place to be. Transit-oriented developments have got to be the focus. Uh, this is the biggest question, and that's why the bill that's being bantered around between the Senate, the House, and the governor right now, that's anywhere between $4 billion and $6.5 billion, this, this uh, housing bond bill, is so exciting to me because it does bring uh, the, the creation of ADUs. Um, it's got a momentum fund to get housing that's been stalled because of construction costs and high interest rates going again. Uh, it's, it's got, um, um, I think I'm out of time, but there's so much in there uh, that's exciting and I wish I was up there helping it because it speaks to this question. Thank you, Rick. And Greg, the question to you. Would you like me to repeat it? Sure, go ahead. 
Tens of thousands of young adults have left Massachusetts, Massachusetts and are choosing to live in places where housing is more affordable. What should the state government do to help prevent more young adults from leaving the state? Great. Well, this is a central problem and a central issue that people raise at the doors and uh, we've obviously been wrestling with in Newton and Brookline for a long time. Um, and as a member of the Land Use Committee for eight years and as chair for two, we wrestled with this multiple times as well. Um, the biggest issue and the cause is that the cost has gone up so high, as has been mentioned by my two colleagues. And um, the cost being so high has made it very difficult for, as you mentioned, young professionals to be able to move to these areas, for seniors to downsize, um, and for our own children to come back and live in the towns that they grew up in. Um, so those are the people and teachers and firefighters, all the people that we talk about who need to be able to live in our communities are not being served by the current efforts to build housing. A lot of the housing, almost all of the housing that's being built right now are very high end because the private market is driving, the, we're relying on the private market to do the building. Um, while that's, there's definitely a role for all hands to be on deck, the sole focus on private market doing this is not serving us well. That's why I'm so excited about the governor's bill, as has been alluded to. She's putting, four, she put, wanted to put $4 billion in, $2 billion into affordable uh, housing and, and public housing uh, units, uh, allowing ADUs, which are accessory uh, units, um, and also uh, providing the real estate uh, transfer tax, which was not uh, agreed to. But in addition, we need to have public-private partnerships, state land, state money going to nonprofits to build more middle affordable housing. Great. Thank you, Greg. Uh, we'll move on to the next question. And Rick, this starts with you. Massachusetts has passed a policing reform bill that creates an independent civilian-led commission to standardize their certification, training, and decertification of police officers, bans the use of chokeholds, limits the use of deadly force, creates a duty to intervene for police officers when witnessing another officer using force beyond what is necessary. However, when police are called upon to resolve issues with people suffering a mental breakdown, they still use deadly force. What steps would you implement to improve on this form of response? Well, I've already made steps to that effect. Uh, I was chosen with another counselor uh, by, by uh, Seti Warren to do a year-long study of the police department uh, 15 years ago. And uh, 15 years ago, 12 years ago. Um, and it was what we came out with then, far before people were talking about it, was the need for social workers to be uh, full-time, ever-present in the police department. And I'm very proud to say that that was the first time we, we um, hired a, a social worker, or it could have been an additional, I think it was the first. Um, and uh, that was the start uh, of a, a dialogue with the Public Safety and Transportation Committee that I was chair of. Uh, with the police department letting us know that the biggest increase in Newton over the years has been mental health calls. So um, that is something that I've always, uh, I've always had a focus on. Also, um, when um, there were people that were screaming for us to cut our police, um, uh, our police budget by $2 million after the George Floyd um, incident, uh, we didn't do that, but what we did, and it was my choice, my, my, um, my, it was, it was, it was my uh, amendment to take $250,000 and use it for a study to look at our police department and how can we modernize it. And that's what, uh, that, that, that came out, that's what we were doing, and that's the approach I take. I, am, uh, I have the unions in, in Brookline and Newton, the police unions, have endorsed me. I've worked closely and I continue to work closely with them. Thank you, Rick. Greg, the question to you. Would you like me to repeat it? Uh, sure. Go ahead. Okay. Massachusetts has passed a policing reform bill that creates an independent civilian-led commission to standardize the certification, training, and decertification of police officers, bans the use of chokeholds, limits the use of deadly force, creates a duty to intervene for police officers when witnessing another officer using force beyond what is necessary. However, when police are called upon to resolve issues with people suffering a mental breakdown, they still use deadly force. What steps would you implement to improve on this form of response? Thank you. Uh, so as a 
trained lawyer, this is an issue that I've thought a lot about, uh, criminal justice and uh, the way that we manage our criminal and mental health systems is very ar uh, I I antiquated uh, currently. And so um, your question is right on point. Uh, with mental health, if you've ever taken care of somebody who's in the midst of a psychotic episode, you cannot reason with them. They are not uh, somebody who you can just talk down and, um, and, and bring back to reality. So there are going to be times when, despite the best intentions and efforts, folks are not going to be managed by just talking. At the same time, police need to understand what they're dealing with. A lot of times, these terrible events occur when a family is beside themselves. They don't know what to do. They call the police, and it ends up escalating, and, and somebody gets hurt or killed. So we have to support having social workers in the police departments to be able to advise them but also we need to train the police officers on how to de-escalate. And the important thing here, and it was long overdue, and luckily the George Floyd uh, incident created this uh, pressure to do it, is to have the civilian oversight of police. Because it is important that when a policeman is not uh, meeting, all, all police are, are not bad, right? There are many, many good people. You have a couple bad apples. They make everybody else look bad. You want to make sure that they are decertified so that they cannot move just to another police force and do it all again. Thank you, Greg. Bill, the question to you. The <laughs> police reform bill that was passed in the state legislature in Massachusetts after the tragic death of George Floyd and the national movement uh, of reckoning on policing issues was an important step in the right direction. My understanding is that the legislature is probably not going to be taking up too much more on that topic for a while now while they evaluate the results of these reforms. But certainly non-armed emergency response teams is one that I know a lot of folks, especially in municipal governments, are continuing to push for. It's something that I uh, sponsored a budget resolution on that passed with overwhelming, I think maybe even unanimous support from the city council a few years ago, along with my colleagues, uh, councilors Brenda Noel, Alicia Bowman, and Holly Ryan, all of whom have endorsed me in this race. And the idea there is to have a non-armed emergency response that is outside of the department and this type of thing is going to probably need additional funding and maybe even authorizing legislation at the state level to be successful. Uh, as Rick mentioned, you know, mental health calls are up enormously, unfortunately, and there's a lot to be done on that front, but when it comes to where they interface with the police, um, well, I certainly had an interesting opportunity uh, at the invitation of the NPD leadership recently to meet with some of the younger officers in our department and hear their stories of interacting with some of these challenging mental health situations. That being said, I do believe that these type of situations can be de-escalated every time, and I believe that with greater understanding of that, we can do a better job on that front. Great. And now for our last question, and Greg, we'll start with you with this one. As a newly elected state representative, what committees would you want to sit on and why? Well, I've made no, uh, no secret that I'm very excited about health care issues, having worked for 20 years in, as a primary care physician and uh, taking care of patients and using that approach to all kinds of policy. But substantively, so that's a procedural approach. But substantively, my knowledge of the ins and outs of the healthcare field, I think, would be valuable. Obviously, you go wherever they tell you, and I'm certainly happy with whatever I get. But if I were elected, I'd hope that I could be po possibly useful on the healthcare financing committee. Um, in addition to that, there's so much interest and importance in getting our transit system up and running. I would, uh, you know, I take the T every day to work. I have for the last 20 years. So, um, you know, I've seen all kinds of attempts and, and claims that they're going to address it or money put into it, but that money has gone after bad and it's not really turned into what we need. Now we need to have oversight of the investments that we're going to make in the, in the T and in the bus system. Um, and I would be uh, very excited to be in, uh, on the oversight committee for that as well. Um, I'll just say that, um, you know, in the legislature, you have to try to be effective. You have to know how to work with people. You know, have to know how to work uh, with people who might have differing views of yours. So that's why I don't go into the legislature with any uh, you know, preset uh, my way or the highway approach. I'm going to try to work with everybody and um, see where there are places where we can work together. Thank you, Greg. Bill, the question to you. 
Well, uh, as Greg correctly mentioned, when you're a freshman uh, elected official for anything, you often don't get a lot of choice in the matter, and I certainly remember that uh, as a city councilor. And I was very happy to find my niche on whatever committees I was assigned to, and I found great projects to work on. That being said, if I get my pick, I would love to be on the Telecommunications and Utilities Committee. I think that utilities are something that interact with people's daily lives so much of the time, whether it's literally the telecommunications utilities specifically, or certainly the gas utilities and the power companies. These are things that people at the doors talk to me about all the time, especially our seniors. And I think that uh, there's a lot of work that goes on in that committee every single term around energy issues and around these utilities regulations issues. I also would really be interested, of course, in working on labor issues. I think that labor law reform supporting our unions and working people is going to be key to effectively getting work done on our goals for climate, housing, and transit. It's going to be very difficult to do those successfully without working with those folks. So for example, the iron workers who've endorsed me, they're big focus is on ending exploitation of immigrant workers so they can be properly represented and on stopping wage theft which goes on all the time in this state and is one of the largest sources of theft in our economy and if we can work to reform these things and get this out we're gonna have a much better outcome on things like the Green New Deal the housing crisis and public transportation improvements thank you thank you Bill Rick the question to you I think uh, what, what everybody does is bring their strength, their day job, their experience to the state house. So for me, it would be everything housing, absolutely, uh, we're, and business as well. Community development and small business joint uh, committee would be somewhere that I could bring my 33 years of experience. Um, economic development and emerging technologies uh, would be a, a, a fascinating uh, committee for me. Um, the, the governor's green tech uh, initiative right now for a billion dollars to create 16 billion dollars of income and 7,000 jobs. That kind of thing uh, energizes me. And anything in transportation. I would love to work in the uh, Philip Eng era uh, of the T. He's doing such an amazing job moving things forward in the finances that he has to deal with. He's a real engineer uh, and not a politician. Uh, so uh, the transportation committee is something that I would be uh, very excited to work on. Great. Thank you. We will now finish with a 60 second closing statement from each candidate. And Greg, we will begin with you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for having this forum and for moderating it. My name is Greg Schwartz, and I'm running to be your next state representative from the 12th Middlesex District. I'm running to replace and, and succeed Ruth Balzer, uh, the current state rep who's been there for 25 years, fighting for all of us and has been an advocate on public lands, preservation, mental health, uh, reproductive rights, and uh, environmental protection. And she has endorsed me. Please join her and me in putting a person who has scientific background so I can approach the issues with a fact-based problem-solving approach, government experience from eight years on the City Council of Newton, and legal training with a JD that informs my approach to policy making and legislative drafting, making sure that the policies that we enact will have the impact that we hope that they'll have. I'm a primary care physician. I believe in prevention. Please let me help you in the next two years uh, make changes now so that we can prevent harms in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Rick, you have 60 seconds for your closing statement. Me. Yes. Thank you. Uh, as you can see, we are all three caring Democrats, all stepping up to say, here I am. I know from all the conversations that I've had out in the district that there's respect for all three of us, and I'm proud to be a part of that. What sets me apart is experience. Experience matters. My 22 years on the council, at times I've worked tirelessly uh, through COVID with the mayor uh, and, and also uh, have cha chaired land use. Uh, and I've overseen some of the most significant projects to the finish line. I've gone from an impatient 30-year-old alderman to a seasoned city councilor ready to bring my experience and wisdom to the State House. I promise to keep my door open always, and I promise to work on legislat legislation that's going to move uh, your values forward in this Commonwealth forward. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. And Bill, you have 60 seconds for your closing statement. I'm City Councilor Bill Humphrey. I'm asking you to believe in Massachusetts, to believe that we can live up to our reputation nationally and be a commonwealth for everyone. 
we can work on climate, housing, transportation. We can work with the folks who have to work every day with the legislators who have endorsed my candidacy, the Mass Sierra Club, Progressive Mass, Progressive Democrats of Massachusetts, Mass Alliance, MA, 1199 SEIU, the uh, Newton Teachers, the Iron Workers. We need a full-time state representative working on these issues, responding to your calls and emails. And I encourage you to visit BillHumphrey.org to learn more about me and my vision for Massachusetts. And I invite you to join that because I think you're going to find a lot of things that you like. Thank you, Bill. This brings us to the end of our forum for the 12th Middlesex District State Representative. Thank you to the candidates for your willingness to participate in our forum and for running for public office. We wish you all good luck with the election. I also want to thank New TV and the League of Women Voters of Newton for providing this opportunity for the candidates to make themselves known. And thank you to the audience for all the questions you've sent. A recording of this forum is available on BIG, the Brookline Interactive Group, and New TV, as well as the Brookline and Newton League of Women Voters websites. The primary election is Tuesday, September 3rd, right after Labor Day. The polls will be open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. If you will not be able to go to the polls on September 3rd, you can vote absentee or early, by mail, or in person, as well as voting on Election Day. For further information, visit the Massachusetts Secretary of Commonwealth website or call the Newton Election Office for details at 617-796-1350. Please be aware of the important deadline dates for this election. If you don't know where your polling location is, you can call your election office or visit the city's website. On the Election Department page, you can verify your polling location. Be sure to check the Newton League, Women's, uh, Newton League of Women's website at lwvnewton.org for more information in their outline, our online voters guide. The League of Women Voters online comprehensive voter guide, Vote 411, will also be available. Today's forum is a co-production of New TV and the League of Women Voters of Brookline and Newton. Any use or reuse of this program requires, requires the approval of New TV and the League and must be shown in its entirety without any editing, only after the program initially airs on New TV. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that promotes informed and active participation in government. The League does not support or oppose specific candidates or political parties. It does, however, take positions and advocate for issues that it has studied. Membership in the League is open to all people. For information, contact or visit lwvbrookline.org or lwvnewton.org, depending on your location. New TV is Newton's award-winning state-of-the-art media center, specializing in television production, training, and building community partnerships. It is Newton's primary source of locally relevant programming. Membership in New TV is open to all Newton residents. For information, call 617-965-7200 or visit their website at newtv.org. The League of Women Voters of Newton in the 12th Middlesex District thanks New TV for streaming the forum and for handling the technical aspects of this forum. I'm Jen Adams for the League of Women Voters and New TV, and I thank you for watching. And remember to vote on or before Tuesday, September 3rd. Participate in our elections because democracy is not a spectator sport. This is Newton News, providing you exclusive coverage on Newton's 13 villages. We're here to bring you the latest of what's happening in Newton. Whether it's government meetings, education, 
neighborhood events, or local organizations. Your stories are our headlines. Delivering the news that's focused on you. We're connected to what's happening and keep you informed and active. New News, 13 Villages, One Community.